Hello and welcome back to the KCC channel, I'm Rob and today I have three stories for you from the Malicious Compliance subreddit. This story comes to us from AppropriateRip9996, assign the incompetent guy the task of making a business plan. Let's jump right in. I was told to post this here, perhaps the person will recognize the story and see that I did as I was told. Many years ago, I was tasked with making a business plan for a woman-owned and operated business in a rural low-income area where English is not spoken. There was a big grant from outside the country that made this project happen, and a country-based NGO, non-governmental organization, that managed the grant. The business had been dependent on the grant for years. The idea was to use the business plan to make the business independent and self-sufficient, so the grant could then go to a new rural area and begin again with a new business employing new women. I worked for the NGO administering the grant. I explained that I was not the best person to do a business plan because 1. I don't speak the language. 2. I never owned a business. 3. I don't have a business degree nor have I ever taken a business course. 4. I don't have any experience or knowledge of what a business plan is. They insisted that none of the above disqualify me from making a business plan for this project. I should also say that I didn't have the internet to help me. The internet was three long bus rides away and would require a stay overnight at a hotel where I would use an expensive internet cafe that had viruses and keystroke loggers and charged by the minute. The 90s. This would all be on my dollar. So I didn't do it. I didn't have a car. The town had one phone line with no outlet. It was just a piece of copper wired to an old phone guarded by the guy who also reads all your mail. Phone calls were expensive. I imagine that a business plan assessed the efficiency of use of assets and also tracked and categorized all income and expenses. This was the basis for my plan. I started asking questions and I was asked for the finished plan. I explained that it was taking a bit longer than expected because of language barriers, but a description of the grant would help. I got a pile of unorganized papers. Some of the papers were in English. I found out that the grant purchased a truck to collect and deliver raw materials and finished products. There were no vehicles in the village. A bus came through, but no one owned a vehicle. No one had ever seen a truck. Also, it said that the grant purchased the building of the business. However, in talking with the locals many times using redundant terms and phrases to ensure understanding, I learned that the building was rented. I met the owner who had no affiliation with the business. They just sat collecting rent money each month. This was surprising because I had been told by the NGO that the building was owned by the business. I imagine that somewhere there was someone in the capital city sitting on a fat stack of cash, enough to buy a house, and driving a free truck to their summer house with a pool. It occurred to me that they picked me to make the business plan because I wouldn't do a thorough job and find these discrepancies. They also would not expect me to report their embezzlement to the organization doing the embezzlement. However, that is what I did. I told the NGO that self-sufficiency would always be a long way off if the business was hampered by rent that was more than collective monthly wages. I mentioned that selling the truck might help, as it appeared to not be used for the purposes listed in the grant. I sent my business plan in. The country that provided the grant visited. The missing truck mysteriously showed up. The ambassador person was surprised to see me in this rural village. I looked like I was not from there and they spoke some English. They asked if I lived there. I said, yes. They asked if I knew what was going on. I said, yes. The NGO person from the capital was there and overheard. They knew what I knew and also knew that the ambassador would not love to hear about embezzlement, even though it is common in low income areas with NGOs. That is when I lost my job. I never told the ambassador that money was misappropriated I believe that to do so would result in some consequences, trumped up charges for embarrassing country officials, where I would be at a tremendous disadvantage in a country that the ambassador would not be able to help me with. Also, the fact that the conversation ended there tells me that the ambassador was not at their first rodeo 
and knew that it was 90% performance. I think he genuinely wanted to see some good come to the village, even if it didn't meet the level specified in the grant. I think the question about, do you know what is going on, was merely to see if I saw what he was seeing. I feel proud of what I did because I probably could have turned in a crap business plan and they would have praised me for it, but I did exactly what I was told, even though it was difficult and challenging. And for that, my services were no longer needed. I guess I'm missing the part where they face consequences of my compliance, but it felt good to let them know they were not so sly as they thought. And I got out of a situation where I could have been partly blamed for corruption had I stayed. This is an incredibly powerful story of integrity, courage, and commitment to doing the right thing, even in the face of potential personal consequences. Your commitment to truth and justice, despite the many challenges you faced, is commendable. You took on a task for which you felt unqualified, yet you approached it with such dedication and thoroughness that you uncovered deep-seated corruption. Your story highlights the importance of transparency and accountability in all operations, but particularly in the field of development, where funds are meant to alleviate poverty and promote socioeconomic growth. It's unfortunate that corruption remains an issue in many places, hindering progress and misdirecting funds that could be used to help those who truly need it. It's also a reminder that the right thing to do is not always the easiest path to take. You lost your job, but you maintained your integrity, and that is something no one can take away from you. Despite not having the typical qualifications to create a business plan, your diligent work led to the exposure of corruption. This illustrates that an open mind, a commitment to learning, and a desire to do what is right can be just as valuable as a formal education or experience. I applaud your strength and integrity. Your story is a sobering reminder of the realities many face, but it also offers hope. Your actions did make a difference, even if the immediate outcome wasn't as just as it should have been. This is a thought-provoking and inspiring tale that will undoubtedly resonate with many readers. This story comes to us from Faulty Carbon. Keep rinsing the rice until the water runs clear? Got it. Let's jump right in. Years ago, I was a cook at a well-known fast casual restaurant known for their large burritos and charging extra for guac. I worked hard because the place was very understaffed, given the number of customers that came in. Management was understanding when we had to cut corners to make sure people did not wait for food. One of the rules we had to follow before cooking the rice was to rinse the raw rice three times until the water runs clear. Vague? I know. How clear is clear? What if, after three rinses, the water is not clear, three times and runs clear, or three times or runs clear? Who knows? I did not ask. Most of the time, we would give the rice one or two rinses before throwing it in the cooker. Never had any problems with customers complaining about it, and we never ran out of rice. Since there were never any problems, management did not care. Everyone was happy. That is until, one day, Miss Manager decides it is time to enforce every single rule exactly. Not sure why. To get to the position she was in, she knew how to do all the individual tasks in the kitchen. So, she knew the rules. However, she did not know how to conduct the symphony of the dozens of simultaneous tasks at the speed and accuracy required to keep customers moving and to never burn anything. I did. She did not know which corners were okay to cut and which ones were not. I did. I was getting ready for the busy shift, but the kitchen was not in busy mode yet. I am rinsing rice and Miss Manager approaches me, Make sure to rinse the rice until the water runs clear. I look at her and respond, I always do. She knew I was lying, but she knew why. She knew that it would take longer to make the rice. But I was the only one who could make sure that the rice never runs out. Her life would be heck if we ran out of rice. She had a chance to let it go. She did not, though. Mr. Cook, I know you don't follow that rule. Keep rinsing the rice until the water runs clear. And before you put this rice on the cooker, come find me and show me that it runs clear. I looked at her with a straight face and replied, Keep rinsing the rice until the water runs clear. Got it. I begin. Fill the pot of rice with water, agitate the rice, pull out the perforated part of the pot, and dump out all the cloudy water. 
After three times, the water still resembles water skim milk. I look up. She is watching me. She asks, does that water look clear to you? It was rhetorical. I see how it is. I start rinsing again. Satisfied, she walks away. I continue repeating the process. A while goes by, and yes, I am counting the number of times. The long grains of rice are breaking apart, and the entire pot is turning into a strange, mushy mixture of white rice. Given the time I am taking on this dumb task, everything else that needs to get started in the kitchen is falling behind. Finally, Miss Manager appears in the kitchen again. You're still rinsing rice? The timing was perfect. I dump out the water in front of her and ask, Does the water look clear to you? As I dump out the precursor to slightly watered down horchata, she safely says, No. I step away from the sink. How many times do you think I've rinsed this rice? I ask. Seven? She answers. No. Try 37. I wasn't joking. I have rinsed this rice 37 times, and the water is not running clear to your satisfaction. Should I continue? She looks at the rice, knows it is unusable, and that she has lost the fight. On one hand, she cannot tell me to keep going because the ground up rice was only a few rinses and a cook away from becoming grits. On the other hand, she cannot tell me to stop rinsing because then she would be in violation of the sacred rice rinsing commandment. Additionally, she cannot fire me, otherwise the store could not open. She scheduled me to work the entire day, and she sure knows that she could not do what I do in the kitchen. Fine, she relents. Go back in there and make sure we're ready when it's time to open. I laughed to myself as I went back to work. I win. Ah, the joys of working in a fast casual restaurant, the epic battle between the rice and Miss Manager, with the fate of the entire kitchen hanging in the balance. It's like a high stakes drama unfolding in the sink. I can imagine the frustration of trying to decipher the vague instructions, of rinse the rice until the water runs clear. Seriously, how clear is clear? Are we talking crystal clear like a mountain spring, or just clear enough to avoid the occasional rice residue floating around? The mysteries of culinary protocol, my friends. But fear not, our hero Mr. Cook emerges as the champion of rice rinsing. Armed with perseverance and a healthy dose of stubbornness, he takes on the arduous task of rinsing that rice like a pro. 37 times, people. That's dedication right there. I hope he had a little rice rinse counter because, at that point, he was practically an Olympic athlete in the sport of rice rinsing. And let's not forget Miss Manager, the enforcer of rules and keeper of the sacred rice rinsing commandment. She may have underestimated our hero's determination and ability to turn a simple task into a comedic showdown. The poor woman found herself caught in a bind, unable to tell him to stop or continue, all while knowing that firing him would be a recipe for disaster. Yes, pun intended. In the end, Mr. Cook emerges victorious, grinning like a mischievous culinary mastermind. The restaurant can open its doors, the rice is ready, and the day is saved. It's a triumph for all the underdogs in the kitchen who know that sometimes bending the rules can lead to the best outcomes. So here's to you, Mr. Cook, the rice rinsing extraordinaire. May your future endeavors be filled with clear water, perfectly cooked grains, and plenty of humor to spice up your culinary adventures. This story comes to us from Unreal Square. Want to make petty demands while I'm solving our mutual problem? Okie doke. Let's jump right in. Background. This happened a while ago when we lived on a city block of semi-detached houses with tiny front yards. At one point, the older guy who lived next door, there was an alley with sidewalks and grass separating our house from his, which had another house attached to it, passed away, and Flipper got hold of the house. They basically did a cosmetic pass and sold it for tons more money than they paid. New neighbors seemed nice, but immediately began having tons of problems with the house. And, a couple years later, had moved across the country and abandoned the property. I had their number and called to ask if they minded me cutting the grass in front, because it was really long. They were super apologetic and explained they just couldn't afford to keep up with the repairs and the mortgage. The house was going to be foreclosed on, and even tried to pay me for cutting the grass, which I refused. It only took about five minutes extra, these are city yards we're talking about, 
and kept it from looking like there was a vacant house on the block. One day, I had just gotten done cutting the grass and went back inside when there was some knocking at the door. I look out and it's the neighbor two houses down with the vacant in between us attached to their house. They were sort of urgently, angrily demanding that I come look at something. Thinking there was something consequential going on, I came out and walked with them to the front of their house. Neighbor, looking at their yard in irritation, do you see what's going on here? Me, looking around, having not a clue, uh... So it turns out that each time I cut the grass, I was inadvertently blowing grass clippings onto the neighbor's landscape pavers, and they were really not pleased with this. I tried to explain how I was just trying to help keep the block looking nice by cutting the grass, and that as soon as a mild breeze came by, the grass clippings would vanish from the pavers. Well, they weren't too happy with that and demanded that I keep the clippings off their pavers or sweep them off whenever I cut the grass. At that point, I was pretty annoyed, but just said in my nicest neighbor voice, no problem at all. I'll take care of it. You won't have any more issues. Went to get a push broom, swept their pavers off real nice, and then proceeded to comply with the request. I made darn sure zero grass clippings got on their pavers by not ever cutting the grass in front of the abandoned house attached to their house, remember, again. It looked atrocious until it dawned on them that it was now their responsibility and ended up having to pay someone to keep cutting it until the house went through foreclosure. Well, it seems like this tale takes lawn and order to a whole new level. From flipping houses to clipping controversies, it's a cutthroat world out there. Our protagonist mows the line and inadvertently turned a tidy neighborhood into a turf war zone. But fear not, for in the end, the grumpy neighbors reaped what they sowed, having to pay the price for their paver predicament. It's a lawn mowing lesson in karma that reminds us to tread carefully in the green pastures of neighborly relations. So let's all raise our glasses and toast to the grassy adventures that keep our lawns and our lives far from being a bunch of weeds. Check out all three OPs linked in the description down below. I thank you for watching. I hope you have a wonderful day and we'll see you tomorrow.